your your life's not going to be great as a rookie. Okay? It's not going to be. Your first two years are going to stink. Hello, my friends. Kenny Stevens here, and welcome to Rookie Real Estate, where your road to success begins right here and right now. Whether you're looking to transition from your day job to your dream job, or you're on the road to your first 50 transactions, success is in the details, my friends, and we're going to unpack the fundamental principles required for you to thrive. Are you ready? Let's do this. All right, welcome back, my friends. We've got no time to waste in jumping right in. I've been looking forward to this day for a long time, and it's a true honor to have this man sitting right next to me. Now, as you guys know, I'm always looking for a way to teach you guys something. And as I introduce this gentleman, I've got to articulate the alphabet soup behind his name. They're called designations. And there's a long list of them, but I want to go through them because it's a good time for you to learn. Now, eventually you'll appreciate what these mean and the dedication required to obtain the different designations. My friends, I'd like to welcome Brian Copeland to Rookie Real Estate today. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule and coming here. Most people don't know it's like really early in the morning and you're so happy. Oh my (laughs) gosh. (laughs) Like I'm usually getting to the gym about this time and being droggy, but it's amazing the energy here. So thanks for- Well, Tara gets on to me all the time. She's like, you roll out of bed, you're bouncing off the walls, you're killing me, but I'm usually asleep by like nine or 9.30, so. But you know, I think the way you start your morning is a huge part of this. I agree. Uh, my kids, I looked at mine this morning and I said, you're going to have a great day today. I said, you know why? Because you're smart. Everyone likes you. Y- you you really treat people well. And that's what's going to make you have a really good day. So I think how you set your day is great. And you're giving me a good lesson right today. Right off the bat. Yeah. So let's break this down real quick, guys. Look, Brian Copeland recently launched his new company called Doorbell Real Estate. And he is the Nashville and Beyond team leader. Now, Brian is a business coach and also a business advisor. And you'll see this. You'll pick this up in our conversations today. Now, Brian's got a bachelor's from Carson Newman, a master's from the University of Tennessee, Knoxville, go Vols. Uh, designations called CRS, which is a Certified Residential Specialist. He's a GRI, a Graduate Realtor Institute, a CIPS, which is a Certified International Property Specialist, an EPRO, which is a Master of Advanced Digital Marketing, ABR, Accredited Buyer's Representative, and he's a broker. Brian was a 2011 Nashville Realtor of the Year. He's been one of the most sought after real estate speakers in America, emceeing and keynoting some of the largest conferences in the profession, which is actually the first time I ever saw Brian Copeland. And he served as 2017 president of the Tennessee Realtors. He's currently the vice president of the National Association of Realtors, and he's a secretary treasurer of Nashville Association of Realtors. And Brian advocates for property rights at the local level, state level, and national levels, and is a huge RPAC investor. He's been named one of the the 100 most influential real estate leaders in America, top 200 power social influencers, founder of Rebar Camp here in Nashville, and is celebrating his 10th anniversary of Rebar Camp here in just a couple of weeks where people all across the country come here to attend this event. It is epic. If anybody was ever wondering who the smartest guy in the room was, we just clarified it right there. It's crazy, Brian, the list. It's of called insecurity. Right there. <laughs> I mean, that's all that no, is. that is not a big truck for a small guy. This is a this is a laundry list of things that you have just poured your life into real estate. Apparently, from day one, because when I met you, it was probably eight years ago. You were emceeing the. Uh, CRS, celebration yeah. uh, in Vegas and met you there and then quickly you know became friends after that but that was probably eight years ago which was halfway through your career you were in the business about seven years from that now you started when in 2005 is that correct yeah I started in 2005 and one of the things that's funny because it's a rookie real estate podcast and I was rookie of the year right in Nashville back in 2006 yes uh, so you know I'd closed you know I woke up in nine months and I'd closed like close to 70 transactions and had no clue how and it's funny now because I think when you sit here talking through what we're doing today, you go, wow, 
this is which I, I everything I'd known back then. And, and it was such a foggy time when you're a rookie and you're sitting there because I know you're listening to this today going, I don't know where I'm going to get my next deal. Um, I don't know what's going on here, but you just have to continue the, pro- the processes. And when we look at all the designations you were talking about earlier, none of those are done. Uh, while, they, while they help your mind, and, and, and you went, uh, Kenny went over a lot of these this morning, uh, it's more about expanding it for your clients. Uh, right. That client, when you're sitting down with them in a listing presentation, when you're a rookie, it's hard to prove yourself when you're sitting against someone like you and your wife and uh, the, the legacy of your company. Uh, there's such a, a, a tradition and history there. So as a rookie, you really have to differentiate yourself. And I did that through education and being everywhere all the time, as you saw in that that read there. What I always talk about when people are thinking about getting into real estate, they're they sometimes hate their job. And I'm like, real estate really has to become who you are from start to finish. There's not really a time clock. It's a matter of it's time to serve. We have to serve whenever it's time for that to take place, whether it be with a buyer or a seller. We do have family time and we try to set that apart. We'll talk about that in a minute. But really, it becomes who you are. It's a language and it's a lifestyle. And it's it really defines us as as men and women in this profession. Yeah, real estate is a quilt. And it is, it's something you build and ultimately you get to rest under one day. I wouldn't be the real estate professional I am without my history in the music industry, without my history with my education. Um, I served a small stint um, as a director of development for a nonprofit. And all of those became little tiny pieces of fabric on the quilt that I woke up one day and said, how can I take pieces from the music industry when I was in publishing? How do I take pieces from this fundraising background? How do I take all these pieces and, and knit them together to create a quilt that actually helps a consumer one day? And I don't think there's anything else I could be doing in this world. If you asked me when I was in eighth grade, uh, would you want to be a realtor? Would you want to be in real estate? I'd been, I'd laughed at you. Now I'm sitting here going, I don't think there's anything better to do in the whole wide world. Well, and I wanted to ask you, because I've heard you've had a couple of weird jobs too. So okay. who was the, I want to go back. We just went through who he is today, but I want to go all the way back to who Brian Copeland was before he got into real estate. Some of the jobs that you had before getting into and how you decided that real estate really did fit in something you wanted to give a go for. Get ready for the longest run-on sentence in the history of your podcast. I love it. Go. So my family was a touring Southern Gospel uh, group. So we went around saying uh, Southern Gospel songs throughout the Appalachian Mountains. Um, I went to college on an underprivileged mountain children's scholarship called the Oak Dyke. Wow. Um, and so uh, while my father was an electrician, my mom stayed uh, stayed at home but was with us every step of the way. We had a great life, but it was one that was uh, – I was the first-generation uh, college in my family. They thought a bachelor's degree was when you stayed single your whole life. Uh, you know, so <laughs> I was the first to go to college. I went to college on this underprivileged – underprivileged mountain children's scholarship and um, you know that started the whole process and and in this you learn you have to make money and that's part of being a rookie real estate agent you got to make money so I was working like five or six jobs Uh, my first job was as the Easter Bunny at a mall um, and I nice. Do we have pictures I, of that? We do actually. <laughs> we have them great. Uh, that's the joy of a podcast. You can't see them. Uh, you can't <laughs> Google them. Brian Copeland, Easter Bunny. You will not see them. <laughs> um, I was let go from that job because a child peed on my lap, and I kicked them off, and they let me go from that. So you know that's another rule. So when things don't go your way, don't kick people off your laps. Right. Um, and then uh, grad school. Uh, probably the weirdest job I had was as a funeral home assistant. Um, I, what I would do is uh, I would go pick up go on death calls, and we would go pick up uh, the, the the deceased, uh, bring them back to the funeral home, and it's my job to funeral assist some of that. So um, the joy was it was a lot of really good money. Um, I did that while I was a stripper, also. So I was oh. actually kidding. I was totally kidding about that. You know, I can't. Well, I, I, I'm not really sure whether to take it as true or false. That's, I, that's totally why you. False. <laughs> that's only totally false. But the mortuary job was really strange, uh, but really uh, growing for for me on that. Uh, and and then I was working my master's at the University of Tennessee at that point, uh, and I was the uh, I had a graduate assistantship. Uh, to go to the University of Tennessee and then ended up working in publications and admissions. And I would recruit in the Middle Tennessee area. Uh, So I had all the private schools, Father Ryan, BGA, Brentwood Academy. Then I had Franklin High, Brentwood High, Good Pasture, all these schools. 
And, uh, and then I got a call to come to Nashville. And uh, that's where the music industry started. Wow. So from a mountain scholarship to go to college, first one in your family. Now, your brother's a singer as well. Right. He's in real estate as well, which is also a former rookie of the year, too. Also yeah. former rookie yeah. of the year, which is because when he won that, Tara was sitting next to me. She leaned over and goes, wow, Brian got that, too. Yeah. Kind of a brother's kind of a thing. Yeah. So I've got a twin brother. Uh, you guys aren't twins, but you almost look like twins. Yeah. But y'all are really close in age, I think, or closer in age as well, which I always think about from college, working all of those jobs, is is real estate the first like big profession job for you? Or it, was... it was the music industry. I was in the music okay. industry for 10, 11 years. Okay. Um, I was a director of publishing for a record label. So that meant that I matched uh, songs and uh, songwriters with artists to record their songs. Um, and I had a history, part of that history of singing Southern gospel music. One of my friends that I sang with when I was like five and six years old became a big producer here in town, um, produced a lot of stuff uh, that you would know. And so he's like, I need somebody to run the publishing catalog. And I was like, I don't know what publishing is. And he said, you know music, you have a good business sense about you, you can do this. The interesting thing for you guys that you need to know about in the real estate take on this is this was when Napster was coming out. And for those of you who may be too young to remember Napster, this was a big threat to the music industry. It said, uh, we're going to take these cassettes and CDs and we're going to put them online for free. We see that in real estate. Right. Uh, people say, oh, you know, uh, you can't earn a, a, a success fee for listing a home. You can't make money on this because there's cheaper ways to do it online. It scared the music industry to death. And what we learned in that, because I was 23 years old at that point, I started digitizing catalogs. I started pitching music over the internet. That was unheard wow. of at that point. Um, I remember calling Dell Computers and they said, go to Radio Shack and buy these chords and we're going to show you how to digitize <laughs> this music. Uh, and then created a digital catalog that I was able to sell off for the publishing company then and make them a lot of money. Wow. And so when I you know, moved into real estate, it was the same kind of premise of what can you take from your current career that you have, whether you be a waiter or a waitress, whether you be working at a funeral home or whether you be an Easter bunny. Uh, I'm working with a new agent right now and she said, my history isn't this. And it's like, it doesn't have to be. What is the story you have as a real estate rookie that you can take from your past life that can take a Brian Copeland and a Kenny Stevens down because your story's so strong? Right. And we t sometimes think that experience in real estate uh, equals the fact that they're going to beat you out every time. And as a rookie, you can beat me and you. Right. It's how you tell your story. Yes. And I chose to tell my story in a way that said, here's what we did in the music industry. This is how I market in the music industry. And this is what I can do for you as a home seller and as a home buyer to make sure that you're successful and that you see success in what you want. So I think the lesson there in those, in those histories is use your story for the positive, no matter whether it's a, it's a negative or a positive, because my music industry does end with a negative story. Right. Well, we're, we're constantly, I, I picture people whenever I'm doing this podcast, somebody's driving down the road, it's releases on a Monday morning, and they're driving down the road, going to a job that they maybe dread or hate, or they've dreamed of real estate. And that's the person that I'm talking to. And the secondary person would be somebody who's <clears throat> excuse me, struggling in their rookie year. They're three transactions in. Yeah, they've seen the full circle, but they've not yet gotten some momentum built yet. And really, those are the people that they take when they transition from whatever job they're in. I was a police officer moving into real estate, but then I was able to tie up protecting and serving. I'm doing the same thing now as I was doing with police officers. Just when they call me now, they're happy when I show up versus before they were mad when I showed up, but they called me. One of the most successful rookies ever uh, lives out West and he was a pizza delivery guy. Wow. Why would a pizza delivery person do well in real estate? Because they know every single address. They know every <laughs> single neighborhood. They drove it. They know it. Right. His first year, I think he closed over 100 transactions from being a pizza guy. So don't sit here listening going, you know, you could be sitting in an executive suite miserable. Uh, there's an agent just down the street here who was in a high-level executive job making more than she would likely in her rookie year, and she moved over. And then you've got those who are delivering pizza, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, you may be an Uber driver. Right. Uh, what a great uh, transition to come into the Well, time. and meeting people and constantly talking to people and saying, hey, go try this, and hey, that you're a source of 
uh, information You're to amazing. people as a re- Uber driver. They're going, hey, what what should we do? Same thing in real estate. We are a source of information for our clients whenever we're serving them. Well, Malcolm Gladwell's book talks about the four personality types, and one of them is the maven. And that maven's the person who always wants to help. If you haven't read, I mean, this is old book, but if you go back and read Malcolm Gladwell's The Tipping Point, he talks about these four people. And this maven, uh, if you fall in that area, you're a perfect candidate for real estate. Right. So if you're not sure, that's a great book to read. Now, I feel like you're a Barnabas. Now, a true from the core of who you are encourager. As I said, after I saw you at the Celebration Thon emceeing, you said, hey, we need to get together and eat lunch. So I, we got you came back. You took me to this little taco shop over in the West End area. And we sat down and you said, tell me about you. You dove into me, who I was, what made me tick, what I wanted to do. And I think even that meal, I told you of my dream for rookie real estate and yeah. pouring into new people. I'd have been about probably two years in the business. Uh, Maybe I just completed my year that I did 106 transactions. And that your encouragement was you can, what are you going to do now? How are you going to serve our industry and pour in? I was also just at uh, the lunch with Greater Nashville Realtors and Cher Powers, her very last statement and speech as the president her last act as president she gave you the president's gavel and she could not get through really the words that she wanted to say for all the things that you had done for her in her time as president and i see you constantly pouring into people individual meetings like that sucks a lot of time but it's it's ultimately uh, never forgotten whenever you pour into that. Why, why are you that way? What makes Brian Copeland that way? And I don't want that to be a misnomer because some people could be listening today going, well, I can call Brian up and get him and he's going to talk to me or you or anybody. And part of the success secret is the power of the yes and the power of the no. Right. And perhaps you today who is trying to think about going to real estate or you're sitting in real estate today, you're not making the right yeses and the right no's. And I know who my yeses are. There's a list of people that I have that if they call, their call will be answered. There are certain people that if I'm with you while I have my phone on airplane mode right now, I'm not taking any calls, but there are three or four people that if the phone rings, I have to say, excuse me, They'll right. be because those are priorities. And you have to have those same priorities. And Cher was one of those people who she came to me and said, and she wouldn't mind me telling this story. This is part of of who she is. Uh, She was um, time impaired. Uh, With Cher, she would usually show up with wet hair, um, and she would be very (laughs) late to everything. And uh, she's like, I want to be in leadership. And I said, I'm sorry, you can't. It's, it felt like Mean Girls. You can't sit with us. You know? right? <laughs> that all. But she, I was like, you've got to be on time. And she said, will you help me? And so we went through time counseling. And she wrote down everything she did. And we broke those into money-making events, time-wasting events. And what we found was she was spending so many things on, on her schedule of things that weren't making money and too many yeses to people she shouldn't be giving yeses to. Now, does that make you a bad person for not saying yes to someone? No. But you're one of my yes people. When you came to me say, will you do the Rookie Real Estate Podcast? I'm sitting here going, how do I find time for this? I had to sacrifice the gym this morning to do this. So that means I have to go to the gym at 4.30 today, which is my Uno and basket top ball time with my kids. Oh, okay? But they're right. on spring break next week, so I can give that back. Okay, so that's how you've got to think about this whole piece is, you know, and this is what we did with Cher. Uh, and again, I am not responsible for Cher's success. Well, to hear Cher say it, you are a co- huge contributing factor to her being where she is today. Your so. job and my job are to open doors. <laughs> yes. What you do, because right now you're listening to this right now, people, you've got two doors in front of you. You have to pick one of those two doors. And on the other side of that door, there's success. And you decide if there's seven doors of success on the other side, 10 doors of success, or zero doors of success. But you got to walk through the door to get the success. And what Cher did is she walked through that door of success and found 300 doors. And she opened so many of those and did those things. And that's our job as people on podcasts to tell you how to do these things. And that's what we're going to be doing today when we, we come back through this. 
Well, and we we had a just a recent uh, time blocking podcast where we've got to figure out what your day is going to look like mm-hmm. because if you your best day starts the night before. And people, especially when you get into a position where more people are pulling at you and need you and want you and want you, especially when you're president of this, uh, secretary, treasurer of that, and working through leadership, you're tugged so many different ways. So we've got children the same age, give or take. i got one that's a lot older, but the other two are about the same age. So how do you balance being a dad and a husband and a business owner and a president and and all the things that you do? Tell me about that because somebody is sitting there going, I've got to transition, but I still got to be able to be there for my family. And what you know, Terry said is I spent a lot of time selling a lot of houses. And I am now loving on my family, but he knows that he spent some time where there were sacrifices made to get to a billion dollar agent, but he encouraged me and he encourages Tara to make sure family time is critical. So what does that look like for for you and how do you help somebody articulate and, and come up with that time blocking for family? Well, this is one of my biggest frustrations sitting at Celebration and Star Power back in the day when I was a rookie and hearing these kind of stories and saying, I can't do that. You know, how do you, how do you turn off your phone at five o'clock and how do you spend family time? I'm going to tell you in a rookie year, you can't. Right. Let's just be honest. Right. Time blocking is important. We can you go back to the other podcasts and listen through that. But as a rookie, I gained a ton of weight. I was constantly working. I didn't have children back then. Um, I was in a very good place as a rookie. I do feel for people who are entering real estate right now because it, you have to hustle. And you you go to these success summits and you hear these people talk about how great their life is. Your your life's not going to be great as a rookie, okay? It's not going to be. Your first two years are going to stink. Right. You're going to be eating McDonald's when you hate McDonald's because that's the only thing there. You're going to be sleeping on the floor of the office. <laughs> I remember wa- waking up and going in to get something to drink out of the kitchen and in walks the broker and she's like, you look awful. And I was like, yeah, because I wrote 12 deals yesterday by myself because I didn't understand the power of an assistant. Right. And you're so poor right now where you're like, I can't pay someone. And I didn't understand contract to close services where it's going to cost me $150 or $300 to have somebody close something for me. And I feel like I had to do it myself. That wasn't money making activity. I found that at one point I was at that point worth $225 an hour. Yet I was delivering earnest money checks that I could be paying someone $8 an hour to do. Right. Okay. So you're going to mess up as a rookie. And you know what? You have permission to mess up. Mess well, and, up. And you're going to figure out once you go through those contract to close one or two times and then you figure out now I'm a little bit I'm I'm blessed in the aspect that Terry figured out early that when he hired his first assistant his sales doubled, his second assistant his sales doubled. But then I've I've always had a closing coordinator. I didn't go through what you went through. Now I wrote my own contracts, but uh, the crossing all the T's and dotting all the I's, when you guys are looking for a brokerage, you know, when you're interviewing, you know, find somewhere that you can go that meets your strengths and your weaknesses because now some have it and some don't, but there's also avenues that you can hire it as Brian's saying. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a life altering decision to get into real estate. And my first podcast says, don't do it. And it's kind of a play on words because I talked through that first year and really the first uh, three months to six months, how hard they are. And then the first year and the second year, and I can see just a sheer, just a reminder of what you went through is like, golly. And that's what we forget. And, you know, the, so the original question, if I could get back to the original question, I apologize for taking no, it down no. that, that path is, you know, how do you do everything you do now? And um, you've got to block off what is most important. Um, and you've got to prioritize to say, and you will lose money on it. If you, because uh, I've made a point in my life where I said, you know, money's not the most important thing right now. Uh, family's most important. Um, having this give back spirit is very important to me while still making money at it. So it's a matter of time blocking in a way that says, what are the constant yeses you're giving? Uh, are you? We get a lot of calls, um, and you'll find yourself yourself wasting time meeting with people that. Uh, you you want to take a meeting with, but you're looking at you know 30 minutes to drive there, hour for the meeting, 30 minutes to get back into your flow. You've got to say no. 
Um, that was how kind of how bar camp started. When you talked about Ari bar camp earlier that we have here in April, um, I wanted to do something for a lot of people, including mortgage lenders and title people and all that. But because I can't meet with each of them, right. uh, so I said, why don't I do a technology camp? And I got Fifth and Main, which was under construction at that point down in East Nashville, and it was uh, still you know concrete and dust everywhere. And we just set up lawn chairs, and about three hundred people showed up, and we said, what do you want to learn? And they were like, hey, we want to learn about this new thing called Twitter. And I understand you're doing YouTube. Can you teach us that? And we would just sit around and talk about it. There was no organized anything, kind of like our podcast today. We right. didn't organize any of this. Zero. When we got together, I was like, let's not have questions. Let's just talk. And, uh, you know, and so I started that as my give back. Because that's one day a year where those lenders who I have to say no to or those title people I have to say, I can't meet right now. And once they see the, the resume, they're like, okay, I get it. Um, they, I give them something back where they're like, because you do feel like a jerk. I mean, you do. Well, you just and got you to know say I'm not no. a jerk. No, you're not. And I know no. you're not a jerk. <laughs> but man, it can come across that way. Yes. Um, and you've got to say, your yeses have got to be for me and you as both as brokers, people who run businesses, we've got to say yes to our agents. Uh, not everything goes smoothly, so you have to say yes to those difficult calls of a deal going south. you got to say yes to your buyers and sellers. you got to say yes to that sphere, and that's why I say, who are those 10 people that you're going to answer the phone for? Right. Because you can't forget the people you love. And then that family piece. And then that faith piece. I mean, sure. we didn't even talk about faith. I mean, I'm I, I'm, I'm married to a, a minister, right. so every every weekend we're you know we're working in ministry pieces. So there's so many things here, and I'm overwhelmed just talking about it. And that's okay. Uh, part of this is being transparent about who you are, and I don't do it always right, Kenny. And to sit here and say yes, I'm going to teach you how to time manage and time block. <laughs> Bull well, crap. But 16, 17 years now uh, in the business. Two thousand fourteen. How many? 14 years 14, yeah. in the business, and you're still at the same uh, battle of making sure that we're prioritizing and doing what's best for our family, for our business, for our clients to make sure that doesn't change for for one year in the business. It's a lot harder on the first year because there's a learning curve, but it's still even 14 years later, you're still having to manage yeses and no's. And I love the way I've never heard it called that. You've got to have your yeses and you've got to have your no's. And I call it like hard line items on my calendar. These don't get broken. I didn't have a dad growing up. So when my kid wants to get in the floor uh, and wrestle at night, brother, I'm going to throw that kid all over the place. And my little girl jumps in and I'll wrestle with her and my big girl jumps in and it's three on one. That's what I wake up for. I know my why. But I was able to determine that really early. When I left police work, it was dark. It was a dark industry, uh, a dark profession, and severe child abuse investigations. I saw the worst of what the world did every single day. But also, I had a kid at the same time. And I'm like, I'm going to be a dad always loving on my babies, no matter what, not having one. Now my stepdad came along whenever I was 12 and now I call him my dad. So that was divine timing for me. But just as a child, I didn't want to miss that. I see your kids jumping in mud puddles on a Sunday and splashing everywhere. And my kids, I go to church on Wednesday night, they go to Montessori. So we go there and they're covered in mud because they play outside, even in the rain. And all the kids at my church are going to these fancy schools and mine's going to Montessori, which is also a nice school but they're covered in mud and all these are in polo shirts and i'm like that's my boy that's my girl (laughs) dirt under their fingernails all that kind of stuff it's funny you say that because my kids do love playing in the mud but uh, they mike got in bed last night he's seven years old and he gets in our bed about 3 30 in the morning every morning and i smell this horrible smell because he just smells so bad (laughs) and it's okay to let kids be kids um and they talking about what I said earlier with the kids about the positive attitude. And I know this seems so cliche because you say, well, Brian, you know, you, you say having the same struggles you had when you were a rookie still today because it's not going away. And I think when we listen to these things and when we go through coaching and when we go to events, we're sometimes fed some lines that that aren't aren't healthy, Kenny. I mean, I think that we're, to- we're telling people that uh, no matter what, they're going to succeed. And it's going to be tough. 
Right. And it's all about your attitude. And I had one of the biggest lessons to me handed to me yesterday morning. As you know, I, I yo-yo. I mean, I will, and I hate this about my weight, but I've always yo-yoed and um, I, I gained weight. You know, that rookie year gained weight and then had kids and gained weight. That's what I do. And so I started Orange Theory Fitness. I don't know if you're familiar with Orange yes, Theory or not, yes. but they focus on these, these zones and these things called splat points. I didn't know what a splat point was until yesterday. I've been doing Orange Theory for f- three, four months now. And usually I f- finish a class with 20 to 30 splat points, meaning that I was in my heart rate was in the right zone and some things I don't know. Well, I woke up yesterday morning and um, I found out that it was, well, it was Monday morning. It was daylight savings time, the Monday after daylight savings. Nice. Already dragging. Found out a financial uh, error in the books that was big, that hurt bad. Right. Found out several negative things and walked into Orange Theory, knowing I usually get these 30 abstract splat points some way. After that workout, I had seven splat points because my attitude wasn't there. Right. I did not have an attitude of success for that workout. And I looked and said, how is it possible that you have never had below 20 points in any workout, yet you walk in for the first time in three months with a bad attitude and you get seven splat points? Splat points equals your production in real estate. It equals your output in a listing presentation. That seller can feel when you're sitting there with them and you're a rookie and you know, I've only sold two homes. What am I trying to sell them on? You're selling them on the fact that you have the confidence and the positive energy or whatever you want to call it to see success at the end of this. And if you constantly have an attitude of success, the people I see fail are the ones who, and I'm a cynic. I'm that guy. You probably don't see that side of me a lot, but I'm always looking at what, what could go wrong here. And I'm always looking for those pieces, but I have to hide those pieces. That's something I control. You don't know also that I'm really a natural introvert because I get my energy from inside as opposed from external things. It's not if you talk a lot or not. Yeah, I talk a lot, but that doesn't make me an extrovert. What is your attitude for your day? Or if you're sitting here and again, you're working two jobs, are you saying, gosh, I can't do that real estate thing because... Uh, all the failures that will happen, and I don't know where I'm. That's the wrong attitude to have. You have to walk, work. You have to wake up every morning and say, "I can do this." And the reason I can do this is because of this, 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 and this. And how are you setting your mentality? That's going to be a huge part of how you look at your morning routines every day. I I love it, and having you know the the spousal support, the the encouragement of we, we've got a leadership team here in our company that, you know, that they can speak into our lives. Very few that you you allow to get that authority uh, to really speak in to make sure that we're seeing what we need to see, that we are uh, encouraging, that we're, we're positive. And, you know, having Tara and I, some people say I would never work with my wife. And I'm like, Guys, let me tell you what, the best thing that ever happened to me was working with her because we are, she can speak into me and I can speak into her in a way that she knows and I know that we love each other and it's for our betterment. But then that way, whenever we're out being in front of people, she's an extreme introvert, extreme. Now you're an introvert. I'm not buying it, but you know, I'll take your word for it. But that's the part that, you know, introvert and extrovert, I've said in the podcast, it doesn't matter. When I'm sitting in front of somebody in their listen appointment, in a buyer's appointment, I know and I believe it to the core of my being, nobody will serve that person better than me. They may have more of this. They may have more of that. They may have longer years. Nobody will ever serve them and work as hard for them than I will. And I truly believe that. And I think people can hear it. I think people can feel it. Now, talking about the designation journey, because really as a rookie, the learning curve is significant. Mm-hmm. One of the greatest things that ever happened to me was going to the Celebration Thon in, in Vegas, the one you were emceeing, and hearing those people just vomit everything that they know all over you and going to these breakout sessions. And I'm like, there's no way I will ever learn all of that. So uh, I, I started right off the bat going to CRS's, uh, CRS classes because these were top people mm-hmm. teaching People who wanted to learn, and I say where I met your brother and was one of those classes, and I mean that them giving that much information 
with you doing your 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 designations and the journey that you have, I think that wouldn't you agree that right off the bat, start your education in real estate, not just with your broker and little bits of training, but start pouring into all these designations and itemize them and start them. Well, I think you just take a step back and you have to have a personal strategic plan. Right. Uh, you say, well, I don't have a business. I don't own DeSelm's Realty. I don't own Dorbella Real Estate. I don't have. No, you are one entity. You are the CEO of yourself. Me. Do you have a strategic plan? And in that, the strategic plan, there's an education piece of it right. that you will, that we will, that I will take a certain amount of classes. You have to have CE. So why not make your CE Pounce and bounce and bing. Uh, go out of state, meet some people, make sure the CE still counts in the state of Tennessee or wherever <laughs> you're listening from. But uh, be strategic with your CE. I made so many referral contacts because I took my CRS classes in Cleveland, Ohio. Wow. And I still remember those people from that class, and I still refer, and they refer back to me uh, because there's 1.3 million of us out there that are, that are realtors. There's more that are real estate uh, agents. So what is your strategic plan? Are you going to have these designations in your strategic plan? Are you going to think about, okay, this year I'm going to finish my CRS, my Certified Residential Specialist. Uh, you say, well, Brian, I don't have the, the transactions to do that. Well, you can go ahead and get the classes. It's okay. Right. Uh, I did a CIPS, which is the International Property specialist and you learn how I didn't know how money moved across the globe and I'd get frustrated when I would write a contract for someone who was from another country and um, we cl- we set it for a 45 day close they can't move their money out of the c- country that quick because of all the places it has to go right. didn't know that had to learn that somewhere um, uh, the ABR which was the, one of the first things I would re- encourage anyone to do is that buyer's uh, representation piece uh, the ePro, uh, I was part of the rewrite on that, and that's just if you're if you're technologically uh, 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 imped, imp, have an impediment for technology, uh, it helps you understand more about technology, uh, the basics there, um, and then the GRI is kind of the you know that's then that's handled in state, so all GRI programs are different. Um, it, it really talks about professionalism. Uh, I believe you can make money on code of ethics. Um, right. I teach code of ethics. Um, at the Greater Nashville Realtors, uh, I believe that when you center your business around being ethical, doing the right thing, it makes money. And we don't give our buyers and sellers the code of ethics as a realtor. We don't hand it to them and say, did you know that I'm responsible to do all this for you? How many of you are using that as a point of difference? Right. Print it out. Give it to them and say, this is what makes me different. Because when I am your agent, I represent only your interest. Right. I I ascribe to. I don't have to do these things under law. I have to do these things because I have agreed to go to that higher level of ethics. Right. So if you don't know your ethics, if you're just sitting through a class to get your check mark on your training, uh, say how can I make money on this? And it's there. Right. I, I think that having the opportunity. <laughs> To one, learn from other people who are already rock stars. And that I, I've always, I've loved, I think everybody should have a coach, whether it be in physical and business and things like that. But I think coaches also have a span to where you've learned what they know. And now that you know what you know and what they know, and then you go and you find somebody else who knows more than you. And always looking for somebody that, what can I do to better me? I, I've got a great therapist. Tara and I have fabulous therapy we've been in it from day one even before we got married uh but i want to better me so that i can better the environment that i'm a part of and i mean the education guys don't knock it push it look for ways to do it now what's fun is hearing a brian copeland horror story in my mind i want to i'm gonna give you one that i screwed up on that it just i cringe every time i do it but i mean 15 14 years in the business i want to know a horror story that something went wrong but here's here's one of mine i had multiple offer situations and uh offers were coming in this agent sent an offer in of course i review it right off the bat and i'm like man all these blanks are missing i couldn't hardly read the writing it was very sloppy so i called this agent and i said hey you know these are multiple offers You've got some things missing, so I can send this back to you. But I mean, if you're new, I don't mind helping you. There's where I went wrong. If you're new, I don't mind helping you. Now, my motive intent was correct, but what I didn't know was the person that I was talking to had been in the business for 30 
years and I just mortally wounded that lady and she was absolute like I I had to keep my mouth shut as she just went through the laundry list of berating me of how disrespectful I was and although I was never going to be able to articulate that I meant well uh, but it was so bad. Of course, she hangs up, calls Terry. She'd been around so long, she had his cell phone number. And then when she got done with Terry, she calls Tara. And then Tara calls me and she goes, she says the person's name. She goes, 30 years. I said, honey, I meant well. I, I, I'll i show you her offer. It was that bad. And she goes, but you just can't say if you're... I'm like, I realize what I did wrong. I just didn't mean to. Now, she ended up getting it because... You know, not because her offer was bad, because the numbers didn't work out. But I was mortified, and I learned a valuable lesson. Don't say stupid stuff to people who you don't know who they are. So, you know, it worked out for me. But it's I, one day I'm going to run into her, and she's going to be like, I was that lady. Mm-hmm. And I can't believe you still would say that to me. So I learned a valuable lesson at her expense uh, for that one. So you got any horror stories of 14 years of where you just can't believe this happened or you did this. <laughs> what great teaching moments for you as an interviewer right now is you never tell a better story than the person who will give the story. I can't top that one because that's so horrible. <laughs> no, that's a horrible <laughs> so I'm not going to, I'm not going to try to top you. I'll tell you uh, four little snippet things. Uh, I, uh, two of them will be weird things in real estate uh, with buyers you work with because this happens in, with rookies and everyone. I once had a client who was allergic to Wi-Fi. Literally? You, yeah. Well, that's what they said. They were allergic to Wi-Fi. So they would take these Wi-Fi detectors into every house and be like checking everything. So you got to make sure you keep your game face on. Don't look at somebody and go, bull, that ain't real. Right. Uh, I had another client who said they could only live on streets that had more vowels in the name than consonants. Okay? So right. uh, again, your job is to do the yes and not look at someone and say they're crazy. When I think about the failures, mine were transactionally based, and there's two of them that come to mind. One was my very first deal at a house on Maplewood in Inglewood in 37216. Back in that day, we had these what we call tar forms, um, and there was a box you had to check that had to say, uh, we're going to take the inspection contingency. You had to check that box. Right. Um, and, uh, and then uh, there were three boxes below that said uh, that you would take it as is or that you would counter and all that. I didn't check the right box. Oh. And so my people were stuck with the house no matter what based off the contract, which it had a foundation issue. So my first deal, I didn't know the contract as I should. And it, it made the buyers so mad. It made the other agents so mad. But they stay in the deal and they love their house at the end of it. They were like, Ooh. okay, we'll get this fixed. And I didn't get in a lawsuit, which could have happened in a you well, know, situation. Yeah. Uh, the second one was on a radon mitigation fan. And, and, and this is why you got to be careful as a rookie, too, or not even a rookie. Make sure that you, what you write is what you mean. And on it, I wrote on an inspection contingency release on a house on Stainback in East Nashville. Um, seller to install a radon mitigation fan. What does that mean? That They will inv- install the fan. Does it tell them to mitigate the radon down to below the EPA recommended uh, radon levels? No, I didn't write that. I wrote install a fan. That's all they did. They installed a fan. They didn't put anything to hook it up to to mitigate it. They didn't go through the process of that. They installed the $30 fan. And they said, that's what you said to do. So I ended up, of course, having to buy a radon mitigation system because I told them just to install a fan. Right. Now, I think that was a pretty jerk move right. on their part. Um, but that's why I tend to be overwordy on everything. Well, and you learned right off the bat, sounds like your very, very first one, that contracts are absolutely success is in the details. As I say in my opening statement, it's always been the case in police work. Everything's about articulation. When you got an attorney or two or three attorneys drilling you on the stand, Mm -hmm. which I did many, many, many times as a detective, that if it didn't get written down, it didn't count. It didn't happen and how you wrote it down and what you meant versus what was really said. So I, you know, it's the horror stories are those lessons that make us better Mm -hmm. at what we do. And we say that around here, like that one will make you a better agent. 
that situation will make it's going to be painful and potentially expensive. So you want to minimize this, but having a good broker, having a good mentor, it's like who poured into you whenever you were brand new? Did the structure then versus now? I know that we've got layers of people who look at things. You know, that that was something that uh, we decided right off the bat. We got to make sure because it all comes down on Tara's shoulders as broker and you as a broker. Yeah. You just got to look at those. But I, I think the, the funny stories that I've heard in real estate, especially from people who teach and they're willing to go, hey, this is what I did. And I love that you can pour into people through your stories and through your shortcomings. And not to take your story because this is something I actually did, but it would have helped you in your situation. Every transaction you write, every listing you take, or especially as a buyer's agent, because as a rookie, you're going to work with a lot of buyers. Uh, do your homework. Know what Zillow says the home is worth that you're about to offer on, because I guarantee you that buyer and seller and the other agent has seen it. Check RPR, Realtor Property Resource. Check what it says the price is. Check the other agent's Trek licensure. Okay. At verify.tn.gov. Right. Go under there, put in, you know, Stevens, K E N, real estate broker, and hit search. It's going to bring up his education records and show you the date that he was licensed. That way you're looking here and saying, okay, Kenny has been licensed since 1972, and he has had over 800 hours of, of class credit, including a Harvard negotiation course. I need to be aware of that. Right. And then you may pull it up and see, Oh my gosh, this person's license is expired. Right. And I've got another issue on my hand that I have to be working with the broker to actually make this a real contract because I can't do business with this person. And then go into the MLS and see what transactions they've done. They may have been licensed back in 2001. They may have only closed two deals. Right. They're a 15 year year rookie. But that's where you go into, well, what do you say at that point? It's like, well, I know you've only done two deals. No. Right. It's about your mentality to go, because sometimes you walk, I remember going in these rooms and hearing these people in my first year going, well, when I close this deal, and I was thinking, I don't have any of this. And at that point, I'd close like 30 deals, but I'd hear people talking about their deals. And then years later, I'd pull their transaction, they closed one deal. And they'd uh. done their whole stories around that. So part of this is a confidence thing to walk in to say, and you don't show your hands to say, well, I know Kenny's only closed one deal, and so I'm going to run over him. No, it's not about that. It's about having confidence in yourself to say, okay, if they can talk a big game, I can too. Um, and you know, I think we all struggle with insecurity. And if you don't, yay for you. Uh, but but know the people you're working with. You don't want to walk in. And you're part of the. You have several clients in this situation. While you have a buyer or and or seller, you've also got the agent on the other side. And how you treat them, where for where they are in their business matters. So as a rookie, do your homework. There's lots of tools to do your homework and do a safe stalking. Well, and if you're if you if you cut their knees out from under them, like angrily or for no reason on the front end you may need them later on your side when it comes to an inspection or you've got i mean it's a full process all the way to appraisal to closing and all i mean there is no bridge worth burning and i never would have hurt that lady intentionally but i learned a valuable the way you say what you say is critical even though my motive was pure uh, but we can't burn those bridges, even on somebody who's been in it for 50 years and or somebody who's been in it for three months, because there's some three month people that are going to be the president of Greater Nashville Realtors one day mm-hmm. uh, that are going to be, you know, potentially a, a broker and in, in bringing deals to you next time that you're the listing agent or next time that you're the buyer's agent and they've got the listing. You can never hurt that or burn those bridges. And nothing is more impressive to a buyer when you're in the car with them and they just see a house and they love it. And you say, hey, let me call Kenny real quick. He's the listing agent on it. And you do it on speakerphone. And that phone rings and Kenny answers, who's the listing agent. I'm the buyer's agent. And Kenny goes, hey, buddy. buddy. Yes. And they're like, and the buyer in the background's going, oh my gosh. And say, hey, man, I got my buyers in the car with me. We just saw your house at 123 Elm Street. So what you got working on it, man? You know, it's like, well, you know, this is what I love. And so they hear that relationship going, wow. I'm going to be able to get this house. Yes, he's going to work on this for me. Right. You know, it's like, Kenny, you owe me. I gave you the deal on 526 Cedar. I need this one, man. You know, so there's something about that relationship. And and like, uh, also, I had, uh, I walked into one uh, listing appointment and the other agent had talked about me. They talked about a, a camp they went to for technology. And they were like, we found that you did that camp. And they love your camp every single year. 
Well, how are you being a maven, back to that book, how are you helping others to where they want to tell your story for you? Right. And then you look at and in this listing appointment say, Oh, I love Kenny. If you hire Kenny, he's gonna be a great agent for you. I'd be a great agent too. So it's just gonna be a matter of who it's you want to work with. with. Right. And if you want to co-list, if you like both of us, let's talk about a co-list. Yes. You know. <laughs> so there's you don't always <laughs> have to win. be in this horrible, mean, competitive state right. um, because you don't want to work with all clients. That's one thing you have to learn. As Bishop T D Jake says, sometimes you have to give the gift of goodbye. And there are bad clients out there. Right. There are people who will drain. Uh, read a book called The Power of Moments by Chip Heath. And it talks about unhealthy people and and how loud they can be and, and how much they can drain your energy from you when there's all these happy people above. I call it, and I've, I, before I read the book, I had this whole metaphor of there are a ton of barking dogs in the world and they'll keep you from entering the fence because you're barking so loud. But when you can cross through that fence and get past the barking dogs, there are 80 to 120 purring kitties who just want you to pet them. And how do you find the happy kitties in life past the barking dogs? Right. And as a, as a realtor, are you surrounded with barking dogs in your clients, in your office, in your brokerage? Is that bringing you down to where you can't do the happy good work to get to go home with your kids one day and play in the mud with them? Well, and, and even you know, running a, a company and, and having a company, the people that you're around, if they're negative – Man, that's just it sucks the life out of you, and, and you realize it quickly. I mean, cut negativity out. So, somebody's driving to work, they're heading there, they're going to a job that they hate, they're thinking about real estate. What do you say? If you only had to say it once, you know, you get hundreds of calls, but you could say it and they could hear it here. What do you say to somebody that goes, Do you think? that I could do real estate. I mean, you may or may not know them. I mean, what do you? what's your script to say, here's what real estate is? Can you say that? Well, I think it's more questions. I'm a question guy. And so I'm usually going to ask, so what motivates you? Um, and, and when you get down to the core of it and they're saying, well, I'm broke. I was with a girl the other day who was my Uber driver and she's trying to get into real estate and she was more focused on being broke. And she kept telling me all the reasons why she couldn't. And in this listening practice, Everything was, I can't, I can't, I can't. And every time I tried to give advice, she would interrupt with a, a why she couldn't. Right. So part of this is a questioning piece. So there's not a script because I've got to check your attitude. And literally, I told her, I said, I need you to be quiet and listen to me for a second because <laughs> you keep interrupting me with your negativity. And so I'm going to give you some very hard, hard advice right now. Okay? And I don't, I don't feel that real estate was a good fit for her. Right. And if it's going to be a good fit, she's got to work on the attitude. On it, okay. So I, I think when people do ask me the questions, I go start asking a ton of questions back. Of what motivates you? Why do you want to do this? If it's a money piece, I'm gonna tell you, you you're gonna have a lot of overhead costs. You got to think about that. If it's about, well, I just I love houses and I just love going in. Well, I yeah, so does CTV. everyone. I hear that a lot. So does everyone. <laughs> What, what would really make you want to do this? And for me, it's, the again, at the core of I believe that real estate professionals open up the dream of life for people. I think we open up home and hearth in a way that no one does. We are in one of the most intimate, private times of their life. And you have got to be a steward of that. Because when they come to you and say, this is where our dreams will be made. This is where my children will see their first Santa Claus. This is where we will have Thanksgiving every year. This is where we will have our biggest fight and almost divorce, but come back together and love each other. You are setting the stage for that. That comes with great responsibility. And so for me, it's an overall attitude of, are they in it for the other people? Are they in it for themselves? Because what you'll learn through this process is it really has nothing to do with you. It feels great to be on a podcast. It feels great to be on stage. But what feels even greater is when that person calls you back and says, you don't know this, but you helped me through the one of the hardest times in my life. I had a guy with cancer reach out to me. And he said, I've only probably got a few more weeks to live. And you're the only person I can tell and the only person I can trust. And I need you to sell my place for me. And the fact that he could go to 5,000 realtors in this area and choose, he chose me because he knew I was a steward. And when I'm looking at success and if when I'm talking to people, I want to know how they're going to steward people. Are they going to care for the greater good of that person or are they going to care about their 
fee or commission at the end of the deal. And while we still have to have our value proposition, you can't give your value away. You still got to think about how you steward those. So I'm going to be asking questions like, you know, why do you want to do this? What motivates you? How do you like setting others for success up in a different way? Um, those kind of scripts. Uh, and that script comes along just through interviewing like what we did today. You can't make up the passion of what Brian just shared. That is a 14 years, and actually it's already who he is anyway. And being a Barnabas, we want more a lot of times for people than they want for themselves, but it's just a matter of they have got to have it inside of who they are. And then identifying that and then pulling out the greatness. All of us has got something to tweak, all of us. Like there's things that I've got to get better at, but at the core of who we are as realtors, as People who are going to serve families, it's got to be you always do what's right, no matter what, whether you make the money or you don't, for the family that you're serving, and it be a life of service. And it is so fun when clients call you and say, you sold me this house six years ago. We went through a pretty hard time through 2008, 9, and 10, uh, hundreds of short sales. And to do a short sale and help a family avoid foreclosure, and then they call you back two years later and they say, Kenny, I've saved up. I've gotten up my uh, down payment. I'm ready to buy again. My family can move out of an apartment. Can you help me? There is nothing. Tears will flow mm -hmm. when, a, when a man looks at you in the eye. One, you helped him avoid foreclosure, number one, which is uh, an embrace and a hug that you'll never feel until you've done that. But two, for them to call you back and go, we're ready for our home. Yep. Can you help us find it? That's what we do as realtors. That's how we serve families. All right, Brian, I want to ask you the question that you asked me, and I have now taken this and added it to my vocabulary. Whenever we met years and years ago, when you said, let's go eat, or we said, let's go eat lunch, and we did, and you said, what can I do for you? So my question is, Brian, what can I do for you? And, and that's always a, a tough question to answer because the easy answer is, oh, nothing, I'm good. Um, but also understand if you ask that question, you got to be willing to do it. Right. Because when someone says, you know, well, Kenny, I actually, I need you to help coach me through this. Are you really willing to do this? Even the question of, you know, how are you doing today? I'm very careful about how I answer that question. How are you doing today? I'm great. When I know that things aren't great, I'm gonna right. be. I'm one of those people. It's like, why did I even ask them how they're doing? That's why I'm very careful about what I ask. So when I say, you know, when you say, what can you do for me? Um, I think, I think first is continue to love your wife the way you are because she's very important in the anatomy of where Nashville real estate's going. We see Tara as one of the strongest leaders on the horizon, not just in the city but in the state and elsewhere. And for someone to lead has to have a great support on the other side. I think you need to be in there too. Right now you can't have both in there because you've got right. somebody's got to do business, somebody's got to work there. But I think you helping Tara helps me a lot because you know as I work in Nashville and and start with you know, we got so many advocacy issues and so many zoning issues and all these things we work with as realtors that you're sitting and listening going well somebody else will do it. You know who does it? Tara and me. Right. That we're sitting here spending our money to get it fixed so you and don't time. have to deal with it. Right. Yes, and time is money pouring into. So I think continuing to support Tara is a big big help to me uh, because I. I believe in her, and um, I think she's probably one of the most charismatic leaders I've ever met in my life, and I've seen a lot of leaders. Well, I'm a little partial to her, right. but the passion that you see, I see every single day, and I, I made a promise a long time ago, nobody will ever love that woman more than me, and with three kids and her being the beast that she is in this company and our family as a wife, uh, as as my person, uh, but also her heart to give was really encouraged by you as well to you've got to give this back. And she saw that and she took that. She goes, OK, I'm going to give it back and uh, I will promise to pour into her and to love her and to support her. That's what I will do. The second thing is a business thing. Um, always speak well. I think this is one of your big pieces in life that you speak well of people. And um, anytime that people are, I, I don't see you as a competitor. I see you as 
as a, a mastermind uh, cohort with me. Um, so I think uh, uh, this articulation of, of a reciprocal speaking well constantly, I would appreciate that. And then the third thing is on a personal level, uh, we run a food pantry. Uh, we feed several hundred families in Northeast Nashville every year, and I would love to wow. see a donation or some food through that. That would really help me and my family out a lot. So those are the three things I'd like to have from you, um, and I would really appreciate those things. Well, Brian Copeland, thank you so much. A name known all across the industry, several hours of your time spent here, uh, coming, spending here, going back to what you're going to do. I can't thank you enough. Hopefully, guys, if you want to send questions to me, maybe ask some things about what we talked about, we can pour into you more. Email Kenny at RookieRealEstate.com. Feel free to send comments. I'm thankful, Brian, for your time, for your family, for your commitment to this industry, for pouring into my life, pouring into my wife, uh, pouring into who we are so that we can make this better. Thank you so much, brother. I really appreciate you. Love you, man. Love you too, brother. Awesome. All right, this podcast was brought to you by Kenny Stevens and Rookie Real Estate, but really the guy behind the camera here, Scott Parker, we couldn't do it without him. He is our engineer. He's my friend. He's our producer. He is the man. Thank you for being amazing, Scott. Guys, you want to contact me, Kenny, at rookierealestate.com. Until next time, better your best.